Ali, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. I um, appreciate it. I, I enjoyed uh, listening to Mr. Redfern's comments. Very bright man, very distinguished background, and probably knows more about the technicals of the market than I know. But during President Jimmy Carter's term, there was a fellow uh, by the name of Bert Lance who ran the Office of Management and the Budget. And he coined the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I think conversely, if it is broke, somebody ought to make an attempt to fix it. And I see no economic rationale for 50, 60 handle point moves in the S&P in a couple of minutes. Um, and the market structure has been largely damaged, and I believe the SEC should be taking a more active role in dealing with the emergence of these new technologies. There's just no, as I said a moment ago, there's just no fundamental reason for these 50 handle point moves in 30 minutes or less. It's uh, up or down, by the way, up or down. You sure. saw it in January, you saw it in February, you're seeing it now. These are trend-following systems that defy logic to a degree. You know, they buy strength, they sell weakness, and uh, it's wreaking havoc with the markets. And the problem is uh, the more volatility we see, uh, investors equate that to risk. It re depresses valuation, and the depressed valuation raises the cost of capital for business. I read somewhere just the other day that the current fourth quarter is something like the eighth worst, worst quarter on record. It, 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 it's the only one greater with the Great Depression, right. uh, Pearl Harbor Attack Day, the 1987 crash, uh, the fourth quarter of 2008. And there's nothing going on in the economy that would uh, justify that kind of so, sell-off. So, Mr. And, Mr. Redford, how, how would you respond to that? Um, I mean, th those... Those issues that Let Mr. me if I just make one other point. Can I make just one other point? I'd like to address the question: Who benefits from uh, uh, being able to short a stock without an uptick rule? And conversely, who would be uh, uh, hurt if they instituted the rule? To see, you know, it, it worked very effectively for 70 odd years. Let's let's who, let's address the first issue that you raised first, though, Lee. Before we get to the uptick rule specifically, mm -hmm. and that is Mr. Redfern, the, the the issue that that Mr. Cooperman raises about the, the sheer structure of the market, the way that stocks are, are pulled and pushed around in, in such a, uh, uh, a manner in which it's hard to, to, to keep control of. Do, do you share any of the concerns that he laid out? Uh, you know, I, I, first of all, it's a pleasure talking to you and uh, I, I enjoy the opportunity. I will say that our markets have evolved incredibly over the last several years. They, they are very, very fast, very, very efficient, very, very high technology. We, t we are trading in microseconds or milliseconds in the way that electronics, and there's a lot of benefits that have come with the evolution of the marketplace that we have today. And in this particular environment, information is absorbed very quickly. When somebody wants to get out of a position and sell, then it can have some impact on the market. And so it's hard for us to be judging why people are selling or why people are, are buying. And, you know, I, I, I do wonder if you think that the government regulator should be getting involved in saying, oh, they, they shouldn't be selling or they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be buying. And, and so we have to be very careful about how far we go, which is why we focus much more on the systemic aspect of the marketplace. Is, are there dislocations? Are people violating our market access rule? Are, you know, are markets being dislocated and the halt system is not working? Are systems breaking down? Those are the things we focus on, but we're very hesitant to start judging the strategies that people are employing as they're, as they're trying to you know, implement their own investment decisions. But you do but, understand Mr. Cooperman's concern. It's, very, it's somewhat disconcerting when all of a sudden in the middle of the day you can see the Dow drop 600 or 700 points. And obviously we see these programs coming in and selling. And I agree with you, it's, it shouldn't be illegal if somebody has a program to sell when the S&P hits a 200-day moving average, which we have seen often in the last couple months. Obviously, it's not. I guess the question is, is there anything we can do for the market structure that, make, that can make these kinds of transitions a, a, little, a little less stomach-churning? Nobody can prevent anybody from selling if they want to sell, but Mr. Cooperman has a point. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to suggest that we don't take any of these things seriously. And as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at these issues with other regulators. So we are in regular communication with the Fed and with the Treasury and with the CFTC and having conversations about what are we seeing in the market and what concerns are being raised. So to the extent that we see things that are, that are concerning or alarming, then you certainly should know that we will be looking at that more closely. Right. Steve Mnuchin, Lee, the Treasury Lee, Secretary, to, let's said, go Lee, beyond, let's go ahead. beyond the uptick rule. Let, there, there's a breakdown of morality in the system. 
Why does the New York Stock Exchange allow the high-frequency traders to co-locate their computers next to the stock exchange to get a split-second advantage in trading over the public? Why are firms selling their order flow to uh, high-frequency traders and other type of professional traders that disadvantages their investors? There's just, uh, you know, I think what the SEC has done, and it's done a lot of good things, but one of the things it's done is it succeeded in driving down the cost of trading, the nominal cost of trading. When I joined Goldman Sachs uh, 50 odd years ago, I remember we were trading stock for 50 cents a share. Now, basically, we're trading, they're trading stocks for probably a penny a share. Uh, Fidelity just came out with an index fund, no fee. And so there's nobody left in the system that has any uh, uh, reason to stabilize the system. Uh, the specialist system is uh, impotent because you know, 90% or 80% of trading is off the stock exchange. It's in these dark pools and other kinds of uh, uh, operations. So the specialist system is not a stabilizing influence. The brokerage industry uh, uh, are not going to make bids uh, uh, on securities because there's no commission to offset their risk anymore. So I, I think that the SEC has got to recognize that the technology has changed and it requires a change in our policies. And it's as simple as that. And a common sense question to ask yourself is, you know, and again, I'm not saying just down. You know, it's up as well. It, you know, they, they, they drive the market up uh, when, the, uh, when the trend is up. They drive the market down when the trend is down. And I think that we should uh, recognize that this change in uh, conditions re re requires some kind of change in policies. And I think it's, more, it's not a coincidence that a lot of the stuff gave birth in 2008 uh, when the uptick rule was removed. That gave, enabled a lot of these high-frequency traders to pursue the policies they're pursuing. And, Mr. you know, they don't care about cost of capital, and they don't care about what damage Mr. you're Redfern, doing to the financial system. Mr. Redfern, I'll let you yeah. respond uh, to that, and then I know I have to let you go. Look, I, I've been involved in electronic markets for most of my career. I've worked on a trading desk and, and helped to build systems and been looking at these issues. And I think that's why I'm very pleased to be able to be part of the regulatory process right now. We're looking at, we're looking at all of these things. I mean, you, you, some of the issues you raise are, 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 are legitimate issues. Co-location and an exchange. If you didn't have co-location and exchange, then you'd have one guy who's close and then other people would be farther away. So there is a sort of an equalizing factor that can come with co-location. But nonetheless, some of the economics and dynamics of co-location are worth looking at. Um, so all of these issues that you raise are, are very relevant. But I will say that there is, are you familiar with the short sale rule 201? Because we, we did put a rule in after the financial crisis that looked specifically at what happens if short sellers were aggressively trading in certain circumstances to try to sort of mitigate that input. We do have a limit up, limit down rule that's in place so that if markets dislocate, that after they move 5%, they'll halt. We'll have five minutes of people to think, gather their thoughts, and potentially come back in and bring liquidity back in the market. So we have focused on putting some mechanisms in place, but it doesn't mean that we can't look, you know, harder and see if we can even do better yet. I know you've got to go. Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, says he wants to take a look at market structure sometime in 2019. Is that on the SEC's agenda? We're looking at market structure all the time, Bob, every day. <laughs> so we're, we are happy to talk to Steve Mnuchin and the Treasury. In fact, we, we, we regularly talk to them. And, but I like the idea of, of drilling down deeper on these issues, and I appreciate We're always listening to concerns, so we appreciate it. We hope that and you keep sharing your thoughts with us because that's how we learn.